All right, so we're live here with another uh, Enterprise MLOps interview with the CEO of uh, a very interesting company, uh, Bindu Ready. And do you want to talk a little bit about uh, you know the name of your company and the, the kind of stuff you're doing? Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Bindu Reddy, uh, and I am the CEO co-founder of Abacus AI. So it's kind of interesting as to why we named the company Abacus. Uh, generally, we, um, you know, uh, if you think about AI, uh, you're hearing a lot of like developments across uh, the board. But frankly speaking, we're really in the first innings of AI. It's like, you know, if you think about AI as a human, uh, AI is probably two or three years old. And if you and the word abacus refers to this very old school primitive calculator. It was the first calculator that humans kind of invented in some ways. So abacus AI, because we think we are enabling AI in, in a very you know infant stage. As to what abacus does, we we like to call it an end-to-end -end ML ops and AI platform. So we've chosen every single one of those words very carefully. And uh, if you want to dive into it a little bit uh, deeper, what it basically means is you can use Abacus to build enterprise AI models and operationalize and productionize them. A lot of the problems with uh, machine learning and data science is not actually building the model, but it's operationalizing the model. It's data wrangling, it's data cleaning, it's productionization, it's model monitoring. And what we strongly believe is it makes sense to have a best of breed end-to-end -end ML ops platform, which basically just does that operationalize, productionize, and monitor models, retrain them at the right times, do data wrangling, and so on. So that's the end-to-end -end ML ops piece. But in addition to that, we also believe that it makes sense for in the future for data scientists not just to build their own models, but to tell AI to build models for them, kind of give AI suggestions and then have AI do kind of like a, you know exhaustive neural architecture searches, find the best model for the data set. And so we've start, gotten started on that journey too. So it's an AI platform as well, where, you, where we have several neural network techniques, including pre-trained models, fine tuning, auto ML, to help you build those models and make sure that they are state of the art. And so the end to end of not just you know, operationing, operationalizing the models, but also creating models as possible with Abacus. Yeah, it's very interesting. I, I had, I had before I had met you, I had not heard of your your company, but when I looked at the background of the founders, your background, it it, it seems like you're you're really well suited to leverage what is already happening in the cloud vendor space because of your time at Amazon, and then to potentially go deeper. And and so because with with Amazon and we had a conversation previously about this, or, or any cloud vendor, the the odds are are pretty high that that an organization is using some kind of a cloud, but, but oftentimes with the cloud vendors, they they give you more of a generic solution for a platform, and that if you needed something where you where you go very deep on a particular um, vertical that. Yeah. Oftentimes, it isn't as deep as as maybe an organization would need, and that's what I that's what I really see with with what yeah. you're doing. Is would that be a fair assessment? That's a, a really good assessment. I mean, there are two ways of thinking about us with respect to the cloud. You're absolutely right that almost all organizations are now using a cloud environment, and also, of course, the cloud vendors have a lot of footprint here, no doubt about it, right? I mean, if you look at SageMaker, Vertex, what have you, there are two aspects to this. Both SageMaker, Vertex, and everyone else uh, in the cloud, I guess Microsoft as well, they cater to what is their kind of like bread and butter user, which has so far been, I would say, somebody who is a very cloud savvy developer. You know, if you look at the whole cloud, um, you know, offering as a whole, you're, see, you're, you're going to see a lot of developers who are very, like, uh, very savvy with AWS, with Kinesis, with S3, and all of that other stuff, which requires a lot of skills, by the way. It's not that easy to yield the cloud, so to speak, right? Uh, and then you look at the data scientists, and they are not AWS experts. They're not like, you know, Azure experts uh, and they are notebook people, but they're, they know their like craft, their craft is data science, their craft is machine learning, right? And so in, in some ways we are kind of catering to the data scientists because we want to make sure that their notebook experience is good. We want to make sure that they have a lot of dashboarding. So I mean, we want to make sure there's a lot of UI which complements them, right? And so there's that. And then the second piece of that is exactly what you said. You nailed it in terms of like the depth of verticals. 
Because if you just have that horizontal piece, then if let's say you're really good at time series forecasting as a data scientist, you know, organizations can't afford to have like a five person time series team, five person recommender team, five person, you know, vision team and whatnot. Um, it's just not worth it. It's that, that's not what they do. And you really want to see what the SOTA is in these uh, in these various different like problem types. And you want to go really deep so that it's actually useful. You know, in our case, because we're a startup, look, we don't have a choice. We have to make money, <laughs> so, which means we have to build products which can be applied, right? I can't just build kind of reference implementations or research papers. I have to make it work in the real world with, uh, you know, with messy data. And that's where we've spent a lot of time going really deep into some of these verticals as well. Yeah, it, it reminds me a little bit of, um, uh, there's a story I, I talked about in the implementing MLOps book, which this will this will be linked into it for O'Reilly, that in the case of my time in Fortune 500 companies, it was pretty common that a brilliant developer would you know appear at some point and they would build like a really incredible solution. Like they would, in the case of this one company I was at, a uh, Fortune 7 company, that they the developer built a logging solution for thousands of developers and, and it was it was it was actually very incredible it was it was amazing and then uh, that developer got hired to work at google okay. and then about six months later uh they they replaced that solution with splunk <laughs> so, so so even in the perfect scenario at, at a, an organization where where there really is a brilliant person the odds are if it's not directly aligned with the the what the bit the company's doing that they're better off actually buying a solution and implementing it because you're going to get something that's maintainable. It's not just about the one developer, you know, and, and, and I see that the, the space that you're in, that also seems like a very interesting place for it. You, you nailed it. I mean, I feel like a lot of developers as well as like data scientists want to sometimes build their own thing end to end. Uh, and while that's, fun and interesting from an organization point of view, there are two issues with AI ML, right? One, uh, really good data scientists are hard to find. I mean, we know this, it's difficult to put things in production. So to the example you gave us of like this developer going to Google, that is happening constantly in the data science world too, right? And so, you know, you're, you're not going to have that institutional knowledge on a long-term basis. I mean, it's hard for everyone, including Google. I mean, not everybody stays at Google too. They move on to something else, right? The second piece of this is AI is a constantly changing thing. I mean, you could even maybe argue like, look, logging is logging. <laughs> At the end of the day, you know, you can do it in this particular way and then, uh, you know, and that's that. But they still change to Splunk because, you know, maintainability, because upgrades, because how does this, you know, when I have a new feature, will I get it? Now you take that, that whole issue was amplified 10 times in the machine learning space. Because most of our models are still not super performant, to be honest. Like uh, one of the key things we do is forecasting models. Forecasting is like wicked hard, right? And so every single like, um, uh, you know, time we make a change, the models can get upgraded. Your quality, your performance goes up. And if you're not super focused on that as a company, you're not going to get the soda forecasting models. So it's super important, I think, to think about like if that's not your wheelhouse, if it's, if you're not an AI first company, if you're not open AI or something, partnering is a lot more sensible. And the data scientists also have a big role and an important role to play. So I'm not suggesting that it's A versus B, but it has to be something which is collaborative. Yeah, it it seems like there's a there's a almost like a hierarchy or a almost like a greedy algorithm that you could use in corporations that. We, we already learned about this in the in the mobile space or in you know backend APIs or databases where you know you know for, for for a slightly more mature organization a lot of things that we're doing now for machine learning and and AI they wouldn't do in let's say mobile development where where if if you're developing a mobile app you wouldn't let the mobile developer you know basically build this huge framework from scratch and re-implement uh, UI controls and Swift and do all these, you know, where, where you, you would, you would want them to use the, the solution that was the easiest to maintain that has the widest, you know, capabilities. And, and, and the reason why people do this is, is because it's easier to, to train people, right? Like, I mean, you, if, if you developed your own solution 
it's going to be much more difficult to get somebody on board in your company. So, and then, and then flip on the flip side, like, as you mentioned, if you're, whatever it is your, your company is doing, they actually might need to spend a lot of time on that. And so yeah. if, if there's things that they're doing poorly, that, that they could actually get off of their plate, then they can spend more time on the things that are unique to their organization. So like, in, like you mentioned in the, in the case of forecasting, it could be the case where that's, that's a small part of what the company does. And they, they, it actually would make them much better at whatever unique thing they're doing. You know, maybe they're making edge based machine learning models that predict, uh, I don't know, manufacturing errors or something like then they can spend all their time on that. Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, I don't, I think people always underestimate how hard it is to actually build systems, maintain it, put it in production. It, you know, if your budget, I mean, if you're, I'm sure like the inch managers among the audience know what I mean, right? Uh, you know, your budget is going to be 10 million and you'll end up, you end up like finishing at 12 usually. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's really, really good to like stand on the shoulders of giants. And I think that's what you're saying. Like you should be using like state of the art, you know, everything framework frameworks products etc versus trying to rebuild things from scratch because it's much better that you focus your i would say come what may even if you are fortune five or two the resource is always limited compared to the you know the ambitions that you have i mean if you were a fortune five company you have fortune five expectations right and so the resources are much better focused on what is unique to them or even like customizing these things like the mobile app is a classic example you don't want to build swift you don't want to build these frameworks but you want to build something which you think will work for your customers. So using these platforms to get what you need is a much better use of your like organization's time versus saying, hey, let's go go build everything from scratch. Let's go build Docker images. So let's go build an ML platform. I mean, surprisingly, I still see companies wanting to build their end-to-end -end ML platform internally, which I think is... Um, a huge, uh, uh, you know, obviously draining resources. I'll give you a classic example. When Uber first started, they refused to go to the cloud, you know, uh, for whatever reason, we won't get into those <laughs> that right now, but they did, right? Uh, and then they said, hey, we have such great engineers, we can have the cloud, we can do our own data centers. And then six, seven, eight years in, they're kind of like, oh no, I think that was not a great, uh, you know, um, idea because we are spending so much money, so much inch time, and we just can't afford to kind of scale this on our own data centers. And this is Uber, which is a fantastic engineering team and raised what, billions of dollars. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, I agree. I think that, 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 that the data science and machine learning industry has not necessarily learned the lessons that traditional software engineer industry has learned where you, you, there would have to be an extremely good reason to not um, use cloud computing, for example, because the, people know the, uh, of the advantages of cloud computing. And there could be, there could be, you know, like if, if for example, you, you needed to, to have a GPU cluster that yeah. was very specialized or something like, yeah, maybe there's a reason, but it, it wouldn't mean that you would get rid of it. So, so I think that this is maybe like the educational component of these Indian platforms is that, that it, you know, my, and I actually put this into a presentation about a year ago that a company should have this, this concept of their primary investments, their secondary investments, and then their, their um, kind of R and D investments. And so, you know, I would say most companies would have some kind of primary cloud you know, investment, it's impossible for the, you know, for most companies to not use some kind of cloud. And then it's, then it's really important to, 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 to find products that are directly fitting a need in the organization instead of building it themselves. So in the case of Splunk for logging or, you know, Datadog or something like that, or maybe Abacus, you know, AI for Indian, or, you know, machine learning, and, and then they maybe they have a third, you know, they have a third is, and they have some bets. Like maybe they take a bet on some new technology, yeah. you know, and, and they have three or four of them and, and you're just constantly evaluating it versus this idea that you just build everything yourself, which is one strategy. I think that's not good or only use the cloud or only use this one yeah. vendor. I think yeah. it's good to have, have, have a, some, some kind of a strategy that we have primary, secondary and, and R and D. Yeah, no, no, I think that's a great strategy. I mean, I, I mean, if you think about the uh, 
again, the evolution of enterprise, uh, you know, software and compute in general, right? If you think about it, like some 15 years ago when there was no cloud, uh, people did have kind of that one vendor centric view because it was so hard to bring in new like uh, vendors easily, right? If you think about it, Oracle was the big, big like vendor. They had God knows how many products. If you go look at Oracle, they have literally everything at that point, right? And then AWS in some ways, I think was the harbinger of like actually allowing for the best of breed explosion in some ways, right? Uh, because if you are on the cloud, then it's just actually much easier for to use use a Splunk or a Datadog. I mean, Datadog is classic or Snowflake. Snowflake is my, you know, classic example of look how well and how much it has succeeded. It's one of the top enterprise AI companies today. And it's a purely cloud company. You can't actually install cloud uh, data, Snow, uh, Snowflake on, on prem. And the reason why Snowflake has taken off the, as much as it has is people now, enterprises have, have like kind of like started looking at, you know, software and saying, hey, for different pieces, I would rather get the best of the breed, best of breed, and then have my cloud as the base. Um, so the last thing you want to do is build everything. That's a really bad word idea, I think, because that's going to take forever. You don't want to be like kind of Uber in retrospect. And then you do want to use a cloud where you are very confident of compute and storage. Uh, and the basic kind of like bread and butter is is really important. I'm very biased towards AWS uh, for obvious reasons, but I also think AWS has really good developer culture. Uh, and then, you know, beyond that, I think GCP and Azure, though Azure has more workloads. But then beyond that, when you're looking at what I'm going to call these kind of like uh, higher level like problems to solve, whether it's databases or whether it's machine learning, whether it is, uh, you know, uh, logging or message buses, whatever it is, right? It's... It, it's really important to look at other vendors as well for three reasons. One, cloud lock-in. I don't think you want to be in a place where you're completely reliant on AWS and nothing else. And tomorrow if AWS increases their prices, which they will on the higher level services, they don't tend to do it on the commodity services, right? Then you're stuck with them. Second, AWS itself get, gets 90% and all cloud vendors get 90% of their revenue from compute and storage and the basic services. So from their focus point of view, the focus is not so much on these like very specific apps, right? And the third is basically kind of like if you're working with a company which, uh, you know, where they have more time for you, that helps a lot too. Like as a big organization, I mean, you, you've worked with all these Fortune 500s. They have a lot of like asks, <laughs> if I may say, right? There's lots of like customization. And one of the reasons they sometimes tend to do build is just that because they're thinking, oh my God, nobody can satisfy, you know, GM's requirements fully. So GM is rich. We can go do something on their own. But sooner or later, that's something the owner is not going to scale up. But if you partner with the right company who's willing to make sure that your requirements are satisfied within the context of a platform, much, much better. Uh, you know, and so I think there is that happy medium. And, and if you, you know, if you were on, let's say, AWS and you wanted to evaluate uh, like an Indian solution, what, what would you say are some of the things that you would look for would it be like you know uh, a tight integration experience or you know are, are there some things like a checklist that you can think of yeah i mean i think the way every solution should be evaluated in the end of the day is not the marketing speak not the powerpoints right it, it should be i would say a poc i really like the concept i think this will happen in the future where pocs should be easy to do in fortune 500s right they if, if they make it so that they can easily trial different software really experience it then they will make the right decisions and now so how do we do this poc and what are the check marks for this say for someone like abacus an end-to-end -end ml ops platform right and so there are two options here right one one is you have, uh, uh, and this happens very often, you have data scientists who do have models which are in Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, you could you do a POC to see how that model can be put into production. And the second is, okay, I don't even have a model or I have an existing model which is like two years or three years old. Let's see what the Abacus platform does in terms of building a better model, which is much more efficient, right? So it's either like a benchmarking, get better models or create new models POC slash operationalization. Now, after we've decided what the POC is, what are the ways to evaluate this? To your point, integration. It has to work seamlessly with what I have. If it doesn't, then it's useless anyway. It has to be able to read the data in from the data sources that I have, and it has to be able to like you know give that predictions back. Second, I think, is management, to be honest, because 
you can always go do open source. I mean, if you think about like over time, why is it that, you know, people are going to the managed service route? If you look at Confluent, which is a company, which is a message broker, uh, which is uh, based on the open source, uh, uh, you know, a module Kafka, Confluent has done really well. The reason for that is managing this service, these services is non-trivial. And it's a waste of your time. If you're an organization, if you're like hiring all these SRE people and DevOps people, it's terrible. So management and how uptime, SLAs, latencies, I think is really key. And the third is just ease of use, right? How fast and how quickly can I get there? One of the problems you will see with the cloud vendors is that, you know, they are by definition, uh, you know, kind of, I would say, um, more like comfortable so they're they, they're not going to go over and about to make it easy for their customers because the customers are already there so there is no push to make it so that you have really good product instead the burden of proof is on the customer to make it work uh, because you can afford it because you know once you are on aws you have access to all these products anyway yeah that's that's a good that's a good breakdown um and, and what what are your thoughts of some of the new things that are happening in terms of the um, pre-trained models, because it seems like that's a space that if you look at uh, Google, uh, Azure, and AWS, there is almost nothing in terms of pre-trained model. They have the APIs, you know, like, like, and I think you, I, I think from looking at your resume, you, you were working on um, the like services, like forecasting oh, yeah. services, but, yeah. but, but it seems like the, the whole pre-trained model space is just the cloud vendors. There's nothing there. <laughs> so, so I mean, how, how, and, and it is, it is, it, yeah. So I guess my question is, what are your thoughts about the, the, the pre-trained model space, like hugging face? And then yeah. does your product have that on its roadmap? Yeah. So actually, just to be honest, uh, the cloud vendors there, I mean, there are two types of APIs the cloud vendors provide. The forecasting personalization, like kind of stuff that I worked on when I was there and still being developed, of course, is uh, models which are um, based on your data. So they're not pre-trained, but they okay. do have those language. I don't know if you've taken a look, but they have language and vision and, uh, uh, you know, and speech. And both so Google and uh, Amazon and Microsoft do have these uh, APIs. They're more use case based. So the thing is with, um, with Hugging Face, right, you have like a whole bunch of pre-trained models and you can choose and select and decide which one you can use for which uh, task. The way the cloud vendors have operated is a little bit more kind of as opposed to model-based, use case-based. Like, okay, mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know, I want something for summarization. I want something for like text classification. And in the back end, these are kind of like sort of pre-trained models, right? So in, in most cases, if you use a cloud vendor API or even an Abacus API, it will be better and I know people probably won't believe this, but for you can for sure I would say cloud vendor because if I said Abacus, people will be like, okay, you're a startup. But you know, a cloud vendor API is mo mostly better than like running your own hugging face model because the hugging face model is an open source model, usually coming from some large company. And and that's you know that's at some level maybe it was released a year ago I mean not so much Whisper which got released right now but a lot of these models are like a year ago or what have you whereas the cloud vendors have good APIs for some of these use cases we do too so we have full coverage we have vision and language uh, you know we've taken some of these open source models and modified them we've done some comparisons and we think we're as good it's very hard to actually get better than the cloud vendor on that aspect actually because they are working hard on that right we're, we think we're as good as the cloud vendors. Having said that, you're also right that a lot of those pre-trained models and those use cases are still limited. I mean, they do have those use cases. For those use cases, they do well. But if I have something like, say, summarization or like GPT style, like prompt, uh, you know, create from a prompt generate text, you're not seeing most, you're not seeing those APIs today. Now, I suspect they're a little bit slow. <laughs> So they are going to release those pre-trained models. They have some which are great. They're going to release more. Uh, and uh, and I think uh, over time, you are going to see a lot more application of those pre-trained models, right? To your point, there is uh, there's a lot of like uh, use cases where you don't need uh, to like label data. You don't need to like train your own models, but there'll always be use cases. So this is why I think the end goal for an enterprise, some models will be custom made on their data things that um, say for example abacus really excels at some of it will be these foundation of pre-trained models and the enterprise um, and the cloud vendors today have some of those use cases which are very widely used in the enterprise world they're not caught up to the most more modern ones like you're not seeing stable diffusion as a service today from google partly because 
it's hard to understand exactly how many people are going to use that service, right? I mean, it's still early. It got released a month ago. On top of that, it's still kind of niche. I mean, I think it'll get bigger. But if you think about it, like Disney could potentially use it or maybe some ad people. But it's not like super like, um, you know, wide um, usage. Yeah, it, it's interesting because the that's a good point. There's some very good points you bring up there that in addition to the fact, you know, we talked about, you know, you could have a, a cloud vendor as a primary and then you have, again, like your Abacus AI as a, as a secondary, you know, solution that specializes in this one in this one area of uh, software engineering and then likewise the what what's interesting is i could see a, a scenario where let's say the the vp of engineering or you know i don't know the head of data science at a company might also create like a you know like a white paper or a strategy for the organization that says look you know we're going to think of uh, machine learning like a chef would at a restaurant and, you know, depending on what the restaurant is and what it is that they're building, a, a chef isn't always going to build every single component of the meal themselves. Like maybe they'll make the dough for the pizza themselves, right? Yeah. Because they have a special secret thing they do, but maybe they buy the pizza sauce from a really high-end gourmet, you know, vendor. And then the, the, the vegetables and the fruit, they, they, they come from some other, you know, you know, cut up already. Wow. Like, yeah. It, yeah. 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 It, 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 so I could see the same thing where, where, you know, someone could say, look, like to your point, AWS has for pre-trained models for certain things like, I don't know, computer vision, you know, this is what we want to use. And then for uh, the, some of the newer emerging products, like, like stable diffusion or, you know, something like this or whisper transcoding, we're, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to spend 5% of our time as a, as a, as a bet. We think that these will be good for our company. And then we'll use, let's say, you know, Abacus for, you know, these things. So, and then, so you basically have yeah, for forecast, like, so you, so you basically have like almost like a, like a, a set of rules. For what yeah, problem. Or, yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, that's, I mean, look, if you, if you're throwing a dinner party, this actually like rings a bell, right? Like if you are, uh, what would you do? Like if you have, uh, you know, you're throwing like, let's say a fancy dinner party, are you going to cook every, uh, maybe a couple of things you want to cook on your own, which is great, but are you going to cook everything on your own? No, you're going to get some appetizers. You're going to get some desserts from different places. And, and that's the advantage of best of breed in a lot of ways, right? I mean, the, the, the challenges people have today is I think most people are, okay with right now, at least in the ML space, they're thinking more build, uh, sorry, buy versus build. They know that they have to collaborate with someone. The second aspect is who and how many, right? And I mean, there's always that, what is the right number? Like you could go down all the way to, and this is one of the you know topics we were discussing before, which is like, should you buy 10 vendors to build out a model and put it in production? Should you buy one for like um, feature engineering, buy one for model monitoring and drift? And the other option is, should you buy like three vendors, one for pre-trained models, one for end-to-end -end ML, one for something else? And then the third option is, okay, just stick to cloud, nothing else. I don't care, I'm gonna just use AWS. I think that I don't care, I just use AWS is not going to be the answer eventually because one company can't do everything. <laughs> this is not going to be this $100 trillion company, it's just a focus issue. Having too many vendors is also, frankly speaking, a problem, right? Even if you, if you cannot have these vendors talk to each other, it's going to be problematic. There is some happy medium. Uh, do we exactly know what that happy medium is? I don't think we know that yet. But to your point, we have to write that white paper. Like, what does it make sense for that organization? I think it could also be org specific, right? It could be like, hey, you know, my org mainly has only first party data. I don't want to do any like... Uh, you know, uh, pre-trained models or vice versa. Uh, and so people could go one way or the other. Uh, again, this is not to say we want to offer pre-trained models. I'm just debating on whether like, what is that right number of vendors? I don't think it's just one, which is the cloud vendor, but I also, I, I think both extremes are bad. So there is some happy medium. We'll just figure out what that happy medium looks like uh, over time. And I think if there is a vendor which does something well, um, I don't think there should be a reason to just go and not use them just because they're just one vendor either. Meaning if AWS were to do everything well, the best, of course use AWS, but that's not realistic and they don't, right? And so I would say like, look, if Snowflake does like data lakes as well as like um, data wrangling well, fine, use them for both. 
Um, so we just have to figure out what that happy medium is. Hmm. Yeah, and 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 the and I think the cost is one of the things that sometimes organizations get too caught up in 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 that in that in fact you know, like in the case of Splunk, when we installed it, and this was a long time ago, it was a yeah, huge company. It was millions, yeah. millions, yeah. millions. And, and yeah. I think people are very, you know, uh, cautious about it. Oh, we're spending all this money, but then it's, well, what are you getting in return? What's the ROI? Yeah. So in some cases, I think you do really want to spend money. I mean, it, in my end, I would much rather spend money than get something that's that's free because free means that you're going to have to spend a lot of work for it where if you pay for it it doesn't mean 100% that that it'll be good but in general if it's a, if it's a good company and they they charge a fair price for it that that means that you're probably going to get something that your company can leverage oh yeah no i think uh th Honestly speaking, I don't think there's any such thing as free in reality, right? To your point where basically if you get something free as open source or what have you, then you are having to manage it. And managing it is the harder problem than anything else. I think in terms of, you know, expensiveness or like how much, uh, how uh, expensive, let's say, best of breed is. For example, we one of our selling points is we are one fifth the cost of cloud. <laughs> counterintuitive right i mean it's like it's not like like if i look at vertex and their pricing and look at our pricing we're consumption based too we tend to be cheaper right so i do think best of breed can be cheaper than cloud so it's not a given that best of breed has to be expensive yes sometimes it is so uh but having said that you don't want to find the cheapest solution i mean i'm not advocating like okay go find best of breed which is cheap i'm saying find the right answer because in the long run uh, the the company which actually gives you the best service is going to be the one which is going to give you the ROI. Otherwise, you know, you're, you're spinning wheels. Uh, and again, to the ROI aspect in ML and AI, that's even more challenging because it's kind of like, okay, it's one thing to develop a model. It's a completely different thing for that model to be effective and actually like impact the bottom line. And uh, a lot of the pro problems that we face are exactly that. You know, we do personalization as one of our key verticals. And there you have to, in, in a lot of cases, a lot of our Fortune 500 customers will tell us, look, we, want to, we don't want to buy you if you don't prove to us that um, you don't, we, you want increase, you, that uh, you are going to increase revenue. So we have to increase revenue or something, even by 1%, because the numbers are so huge, like 1% of 10 billion is still a lot of money. But we have to go prove that. And, uh, and it's very challenging because uh, proving, it's not just the tool like Abacus, it's not just the technique like Abacus, it's their data. At the end of the day, you can only make a model based on their data, right? But ROI, I, I mean, the point I guess I'm making is with ML especially, ROI is really important. You can easily spend millions um, and hundreds of millions without getting the ROI. So organizations should be very aware of ROI. And also, always, always partner with people who, where you have confidence that that company or that service won't succeed if you don't succeed. A uh, classic example of this is, you know, you go to a cloud vendor and let's say you go use their like Amazon or let's you say that you use their recommender service. Amazon is not like telling you, hey, for sure, we'll make, you know, uh, uh, you know, we'll, we will do our best to get you that 1%. They're just saying, here's the tool, go use it, do what you will. And if you're good at it, if you know how to yield that tool, if you understand your data, okay, great, that would work. But, you know, if you want something where you want the ROI, even if it's slightly expensive, um, you should use that option so that you, you have a partner. I think Splunk is one such partner where they are managing to get you to a successful installation, make it so it's useful, right? And so that's very important. Having said that, I like cheap, so that's why we're cheaper than cloud vendors, but that should not be the dimension. And hmm? uh, one of the things I think that's also uh, challenging is that because I, I, I teach um, both I've taught data science uh, at top universities and I've also taught machine learning operations and also cloud computing. And a lot of the stuff I teach is very vocational. So, you know, how to build microservices, how to do auto ML, you know, th okay. things are, that are more, you know, ROI focused. But one of the problems I think right now is that, that things were so academic in machine learning where, where there, you know, all, all of the, the training materials is around like, you know, let, you know, what's the, what's the, the root mean squared error. And, you know, like all, like all of the, the, the details of, of, of like hyperparameter tuning and like, here's the, you know, in this particular, 
you know, machine learning model, this is exactly what happened, which, which it's not like that's not important, but ultimately if a company is spending 80% of their time using like, you know, a bunch of vendors and, and pre-trained models and like, are the, are the data scientists even prepared to, to even use the solutions that are, that are, that, that are probably going to provide the most value? Yeah, no, that's uh you make a really good point. I mean, it's very easy to get pedantic, as you just said, like the metrics, right? I mean, it's funny because when we show, like we have this very complex uh, and very fully featured metrics dashboard and we're like, oh, look, look at the RMSE, look at the map, look at this and look at that. And most people who are business leaders, their eyes are glazing over. <laughs> They're like, what is going on? Like, we don't care about these numbers. And so I think a lot of uh, the data scientists too, actually over time, especially enterprise AI data scientists is like, how do you take those numbers uh, or the models and just say, what is the actual dollar value impact? In fact, we just released a feature part of personalization. We had everything, NDCG map, all of the you know pedantic metrics, and we were still not getting through obviously, as you can imagine, to a lot of the business folk. And so now we're like, okay, see, we did this back testing, but there's two ways you actually measure value. One, very straightforward, A-B test. You know, run uh, our model with, an, um, you know, uh, um, uh, run a model and then have a control, see how much money you'll make. But the other way is also to like try and have like dollar value associated in your like metrics, right? Like if you have error, if your error decreased by 10%, what does that mean, for example, in forecasting? How much less inventory do you have to hold? How much more demand will you satisfy? So always important. Um, and we've not standardized on those metrics in data science, because that's not such a scientific discipline to go about thinking about like value added. But that's what good platforms ought to do over time, just to show you like, what is the actual money savings you will get by, you know, having these uh, models. Having said that, the data scientist role, to your point, is very key. You know, they have to understand the business problem and cast it to a machine learning problem. And that's a non-trivial problem in some cases. And so over time, I feel like what data scientists are going to be, are they're going to be yielders of these tools. They're going to know how to use which tool, which tool to use, how do I translate RMSE into some dollar value number, and, and also understand how those tools fit into their specific environments, right? So it's going to become a more of a thinking job, uh, and, and AI is going to be assisting them. I feel like that's probably the case for all professional uh, jobs in the future, like whether it's legal or, I mean, clearly this is happening with customer support, but it'll also happen with doctors. I feel like data science also goes the same route. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point you bring up. That uh, when I was um, a, a lot of the, my personal experience was in platform tools, and mm -hmm. I, I I ran a team that uh, was was platform tools team, and so we would put in you know RabbitMQ message bus systems yeah. or you know Splunk systems, and and it, and it it feels it does. I agree with you. It feels kind of like that where 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 what could happen what could happen is the data scientists may need to start help being more of like a platform tools type, you know, but, but, but AI and ML platform yeah. tools, and then they pick these in and they, and then they like, to your point, like if, if someone said, look at this, I can do, um, you know, really good alerting, you know, on, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I can find all this stuff. Maybe, maybe the CEO or the CIO is like, look, I don't care about that. Yeah. I want to see a dashboard. I want to see the dashboard from Splunk that says all this, all the different things. Likewise, that the person implementing AI or ML, they don't really care necessarily about the the, the metrics. They they just they, they want to see like, hey, this this model, how what is it doing for us in production? Are we selling more products? You know, are we are we are we losing less money? You know, like you said in the inventory, and and I I think the the AI tools as well is an interesting thing you bring up because. I personally am heavily a user of um, the AI assistance, the, the, the pair programming, like the uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. GitHub Copilot. Yeah, no, so I when I'm writing, that. yeah. And, and I, I see that's absolutely the future for writing code is why, why would I, why would I write boilerplate code when the tool writes it for me? It doesn't even make sense. And then I also have been a big advocate of auto ML for years for the same reason. Like, why would I, why would I do something manually when I can click a button and the hyperparameters are tuned for me, why, why would I do that? No, I mean, it's funny, like AutoML is a classic example where like maybe it was a little overhyped in the beginning. I mean, it was meant, it, people thought it would do everything. Like it obviously doesn't do the data wrangling and the processing. But once you have the data, 
there is no doubt that's the tool to use, right? Once you have it like formatted, why would you want to pick and choose the hyperparameters, like you said? And that's a it's a pain. It's not even a fun thing to do on your own. So, you know, the data scientist is orchestrating that, ensuring everything is working correctly. And I think to your point, the copilot one is an excellent point. Like today, copilot helps you like get better at uh, uh, doing more, being more productive, doing programming well, and so on. Now, let's imagine like two years in, <coughs> it'll do even more. But that doesn't ever mean, I think, that the programmer's job goes away. There's still the thinking piece. There's still the kind of the designing piece. And AI is going to be just helping more and more and more. I feel like it's going to be exactly the same with data science. We're going to have a combination of co-pilot-like tools. AutoML is going to be still very central. And then, you know, kind of automation and all of these pipeline automation is going to be key too. So I think all of that is going to come together to make the data scientists a lot more powerful than they are today. Yeah. And I, I think that what will happen with... Um with with i agree with you that with auto ml in particular and this is what i've told many people and students i've said why would you train one model if you could train a thousand right and, and it doesn't mean that you're not still doing the the, the same thing so likewise with copilot why would i why would i write one command line tool if i could write a hundred <laughs> why, why wouldn't i write as many things as i can it's i'm still involved i'm still orchestrating everything i'm just a lot more productive and then if and, and if you have really good platforms, right? If you have experiment tracking platforms and model versioning and ROI tools and you're running like hundreds and thousands of models, that's great. That just means that now you your your key tools will actually yeah. help you evaluate all the things you build. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, uh, th it's funny that it hasn't been adopted as much as uh, uh, in, in data science today. Like tooling, generally, people have like uh, uh, you know been a little bit uh, shy in uh, adopting platforms and tools. I think part of that has been that data science is difficult, has a lot of different uh, you know pieces to the puzzle, and there hasn't been. I think somebody maybe you were saying this a couple of days ago. There isn't that go to platform anyway. <laughs> Some of this has to is still being developed, right? When if you take the uh, you know database industry, how long did it take? for us to like even come up with these like really cool databases like Snowflake even, right? Uh, I mean, uh, Oracle was invented, what, like 40 years ago? So overall nascent space, I think there's a lot of tooling innovation which is happening. And also there is a lot of debate around what, wh where are the edges? Like what is a tool? Is it an end-to-end -end platform? Is it like just an experimental pl platform? I think the answer is, um, you know, we it whatever makes sense for your organization. Um, because there is going to always be an organization where you might need like 15 different tools because they're very specialized. Um, but there's, you know, the general rule of thumb is going to be like, if there is an end-to-end -end platform which works for you, use that. But always use the tools to enable you. Uh, and that, uh, you know, mindset is going to like... Uh, uh, kind of evolve as the tools get better, right? Because in the end of the day, uh, I feel like what might have happened earlier on, like five, six, seven years ago, when people tried some of these tools, they went away, they came away frustrated for some use cases, which is why you haven't seen that adoption of AI ML tooling as much as like we've seen with maybe some other fields. But ML is maturing, we'll, it's bound to happen. It's inevitable. Yeah, and I, I agree with you that the... Um... Uh, it, to me, it's it's it, in a way, it's almost like uh, a um, a good metric or or a litmus test is to ask someone's opinion about the state of the tools for machine learning operations, and if they say it, they're they're great, yeah. then that's a good a bad sign, <laughs> right? <laughs> because because the, the, yeah, like I I think anybody that's been in the space for a while is, is very frustrated, yeah, because, because the tools are not like mature, like. You know, all the the cloud vendors if you look at which i've been in the space for a while yeah. now yeah. The, the 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 cloud vendors like every six months everything changes the ux changes the the features change and you're like wait what's going on like how yeah. I, i'm just trying to use this thing and it, and i think it's 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 basically to use a sports analogy it's a jump ball right the the ball is in the air and and we we're going to see who is going to become the leaders there is no clear leader
No, the, it's it's still early times. Uh, I think one of these things, again, you see with these tools industry, like as opposed to, let's say, a social media platform where there's like network effects, what I think will happen is you're going to end up with like maybe four or five of these. One of them, I mean, like, you know, we could have all, we could argue all day, Snowflake really better than BigQuery or not and blah, blah, blah. But both of them right now seem to have a reasonable place. So we will end up with some leaders for sure as to like, Hey, are they, are, do we already have the best of breed? I almost think most definitely not. I mean, I like to say, hey, we're very far ahead than anybody else. But of course, there's probably some bias in that statement. But I'm not even saying we're done or anywhere near done because there's so much complexity. And to do that well, you have to design some, th- uh, you know, you have to design things multiple times. Right. Um, and in some ways, the cloud vendors have the luxury of experimenting on their user base. <laughs> And that's why you're seeing that every six months, they're like, okay, they're seeing something, they're figuring it out, they're trying to get it better. We do some of that too, but you know, not, uh, we, we have to be much more directed, right? You have to like, because we can't afford to just throw like stuff and see what sticks. But having said that, there has to be rapid innovation, right? You have to move quickly to get to that end result. Uh, that end result isn't there yet, especially in the complex pieces of ML. Uh, like, you know, where data wrangling is one of those pieces, I think. But even like, you know, evaluation, like how many times do I see data scientists use even state-of-the-art tools and end up with leaks in their models. This is not an easy uh, problem to solve. So there's a lot of complexity in this field. And there's also a lot of specificity, right? I mean, people are like, oh, my model is inherently different from yours. This is not like writing data into a database and like bringing it back. Uh, And so there's also kind of like education in terms of them getting comfortable with using these tools and understanding them. But the tools themselves also have to get much better. Hmm? how how would so so one of the things i think that if if i was looking at your your company's website it, it looks really you know a lot of the 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 features look very interesting like how how does someone evaluate it as more of a hobbyist or if you're a, let's say you're a you're a single developer who may they're, they're listening to this com- to this conversation they're like oh this looks great i want to try it out but if it's if it's only poc based is is there still oh. an opportunity for for like a like an indie developer in yeah. in a fortune 500 company that wants to maybe like sell this product into their company do you have a solution for that yeah, so I mean, the, you don't have to do a POC. You can actually just, uh, you know, request access, and we typically give you access. In fact, we give out, I would say, almost like uh, uh, two to three hundred invites a day to education. Wow. If you're an EDU, I mean, there's a lot of that. And then also every month we do two workshops. We just got one one done today around forecasting. So my recommending, I mean. I really like our workshops, not because I'm saying, oh, go use Abacus, but also if you're learning machine learning, because some of our, uh, uh, you know, uh, workshops are very kind of like beginner level, some are expert. So you can go do the workshop. We typically get anywhere between two to 500 people at our workshop. So that's one way to do it. Second is request access. It's completely free for education institutes, and we just give them out really easily. Uh, I mean, other people, you know, we kind of tend to like see if we can sell to them, of course. <laughs> but to the extent that you want something, you could just like request access and get it. Um, and then there's a free tier. We just don't have like, you know, log in and sign up because it can easily get, you know, the infrastructure can easily get swamped because uh, we, we have a lot of GPUs and CPUs, which you get for free in the free tier too. So there is a little bit of a gate, but you can just request access and we usually give you access. Hmm? Yeah, great. That's good to know. I Because I, I, I think a lot of, a lot of because the space is, is emerging you know, so quickly that I, I think that one of the, one of the things that I've, I'll give you a good example. Splunk is, I'll go back to that again, that there were such an obviously good products, you know, when they first came out, the people that were experts that were sysadmins or developers, they knew it was a good product. And what they would do is they would download the virtual machine I don't know if you remember when this happened and like you would, you would, you would, you would get it running at work and then you would, you would tell your manager, you're like, look, right, right, look exactly. how good this is. It's, right, it's right. really good. Yeah. I promise. So, so it sounds like someone could do that, right? They could, they could do the same thing. They could, they could like kind of like try it out and just say, Hey, look, I'm going to try to convince my manager. I'm going to try to convince some stakeholders in the company. Like th- that's also a, a strategy that, that it's can definitely a strategy. What I've seen, and I've actually seen uh, at least a, a, a couple of our customers have come through that way, really big customers. Uh, and uh, the 
problem in ml a little bit is the data right i mean initially yeah. mind you we had self serve that's it we were like you know what if our product is good people are going to come to us right if you build it they will come and so i was a big believer in that philosophy and we had that self serve we had everything open we started like trying to bring people in and a lot of people came in but the enterprises are really i think correctly so uh, uh, you know kind of like have a lot of like guards on who gets to see their data and everything else mm, so yeah. a, and then the thing with splunk and the advantage like let's say a splunk or a, or even like a message bus have is that whatever works on sample data works with real world data too more or less right i mean if if i take like a sample data set or whatever and show you how splunk will work and if it looks really nifty you're like i want that too i know it can work like that in my like with my data so i mean as long as it's representative with ml the biggest challenge i've seen is you could have like the best model in the world and then when we go work on their data it's like it could be the worst model right and so that is the i would say that's actually the biggest thing like holding um platforms like us back um you know the fact that we don't get that access to the data really easily because by now i promise you we would be like i would say even a 10 billion dollar company if it was easy to get that data and iterate and experiment and like you know uh, get to uh, uh get to the results quickly it takes uh, so we still have in spite of that i think done around 200 250 pocs and have um have around 50 plus customers who are big large customers we have you know thousands of smaller ones but uh, uh that data takes a long time to get that's the uh, you know kind of the barrier having said that no for sure you can actually use the platform check it out use sample data show that to your manager and say hey this is useful and and are you are you planning um to to do certifications one thing i i uh, am i i've been promoting to students a lot over the last several years is that they i, I call it um triple threat which is that they get a a degree somewhere like duke or northwestern or berkeley and then they build a portfolio and then they get a certification and so you know i, I think for an emerging platform sometimes it can be very difficult you know to to get a certification because th- things are changing so quickly but is that something you've considered and is and is that on the road map like a certification yeah for your platform yeah we already have one Ah, well, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> so, We've given out like about 2000 of these. Ah, if okay. You do an expert level like workshop with us and if you like, you know, complete a bunch of things, we'll give you an ML ops certificate, which at least like it it at least it's something which says that look, you understand the key pieces of ML ops, you know how to run them, you understand the inputs and outputs, you understand how real world data works. And so no, I mean this is a big deal. I think it'll keep going. I mean, again, remember we're a startup, so we're starting on sure. a lot of these, but definitely I think uh this is an area which is a big focus for us and i personally would like to think that over the course of our 20 30 plus workshops as well as our like conferences we've at least educated people i mean we would love to give back to the community so we've educated people and developers and students this is why i said for students it's free top of all that we also basically um ensure that uh, everybody who uh, we have a research team so we have a foundational research team which publishes all our research but open sources all the research too So our goal and I think the more we have you know companies even startups especially thinking a little bit more open source think a little bit more open thinking a little bit more education the I think the more we succeed the world is not just going to be dominated by big tech but also by a bunch of like a lot of startups there's a good healthy ecosystem yeah and, and I, the one what, what I've what I've noticed is that I I think it's a very wise move for you to make your platform available for free to students and I and I cuz I I I work very closely with with lots of big companies and and I'm you know some affiliation with like a lot of companies <laughs> like I'm I you know some honorary title like yeah, hero or whatever yeah. and and I've told them the same I've said listen the the best possible investment you can make is to give your product for free to yeah. someone who's going to graduate in a year because they're going to go to the company they get hired to and they're going to evangelize the product for free. So so I think that I I didn't know that your product was was available in education and I'm sure people will be listening to this and they will be really excited and you'll get a bunch of emails. That's great. No, and also we even have done some learning we've done free learning courses with other like Coursera type you know um uh, efforts or companies and uh, we've also gone and like actually i have a a a, a whole one day full end to end learning day at stanford coming up on october 31st so yeah. definitely a big uh, fan of education and, great like, 
uh, you know, popularizing it. Great. Well, well, I, I really, I, I know you're extremely busy <laughs> and I've, I've worked at startups and I know what it's like. Um, and I appreciate your time. I, I think I learned a lot of, a lot of things about your platform and, and really impressive background actually from you, from the people in your company. And, and it's definitely you're, you're, you're now on my radar of I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to pay attention. I'm going to pay attention to okay. what you're doing. Good to know. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Okay. Bye. Okay. Thanks.